Welcome to the fifth episode of Tending to Talks. Today, my dear listeners, I'm delighted to introduce to you Patricia McCormack, an esteemed writer and scholar, currently serving as a professor of continental philosophy in English and media at Anglia Ruskin University. Patricia's work spans a wide array of topics, including queer theory, teratology, body modification, post-human theory, animal rights, horror films, and anti-natalism. Patricia, thank you for joining us today and graciously allowing me to delve into your insights. Thanks for asking me. Given that your writing diverges significantly from conventional scholarly discourse, and I say that with utmost admiration, um, I envision our conversation taken on a more personal tone. Naturally, I'm keen to explore the ideas you expressed in the A Human Manifesto, Activism for the End of the Anthropocene, which you published in 2020, but also I'm intrigued by your own journey of self-discovery and transformation, how you came to perceive the world as you do, and what intricate connections you have forged with both people and the natural world. Well, I mean, I guess my own genealogy is kind of relatively irrelevant, except for to say that um, it's evidence that one isn't born with a certain ethical outlook and that deviation is perhaps the only ethical evolution of uh, action, affect and consciousness in that um, I find with students and also with people I speak to in terms of my activism and collective activism, of course, because no one's activism is solitary, um, that this sense of an ideological default that people have and that people see as chosen and then the realisation that actually it was something into which one is born like an ideological state apparatus, if you were thinking via Althusser, or simply a sense of normativity in all of its manifestations, uh, ethical, desiring, those kinds of things, that there is this um, sense that we cling so desperately to our own sovereign subjectivity that to alter our behaviour in an ethical or revolutionary manner um, is an affront to our sense of subjective continuity. Now, to me, uh, and from a queer perspective, this seems to be a radical necessity and something that is joyful, but for uh, a lot of people, it is a almost confession of failure and so I think that this embrace of deviation and alterity, which is something that is so important in ethics to do with everything from feminism and post-colonialism to um, any kind of everyday ethics, is something that we're really confronting when we're talking about why we do what we do. I think that the baseline is are you willing to confess the myth of sovereign subjectivity and thereby enter into a relationship with perpetual deviation and alterity as a queer ethics, uh, but also an ethics of radical compassion? Or is clinging to that sense of sovereign subjectivity something that is more important to you, thereby perpetuating the mythologization of the concept of the human as exceptional and as something that is atop the hierarchy of natural life. To provide our listeners with some context of your work, I'll read a few sentences from the preface of the A Human Manifesto. This book is a book which calls for action, direct, available and immediate action. It is not an academic treaty which seeks to deconstruct contemporary issues with which the earth grapples. It does not search for a balanced, logical, emotionless evaluation of how human exceptionalism is perpetuating destructive impulses. This is a manifesto, 
I seek here to manifest an alternate way of writing, doing, and reading, sorry, reading and doing a human work. That is activating forces that seek not to solve our crises, but to, at the very least, uncompromisingly shatter the presuppositions, which are the foundations of the logic affiliated with humanism, including post-humanism, so that each expression of life, human and non-human, has a greater capacity for expression and liberty, and the Earth's multiple environments have a chance at one of many varied alternative presence and futures. For those who are unfamiliar with the manifesto, could you elaborate on the alternative present and future that you propose? Well, I don't I don't propose any presence and futures as overarching paradigms. Um, so I don't seek to solve or resolve. What I do is I propose affective activations for activism uh, that we can individually and collectively take up that are at our disposal right now. So they're not so difficult or so utopian that they are implausible or impossible. So, for example, the obvious ones are um, abolitionist veganism, which is pretty much readily available to almost all humans on earth. Um, and another one is antinatalism, which is choosing not to breed, which has a lot of impact on not only earth resources, which is its most the, the most important reason, but also has paradigmatically and philosophically a lot of impact on the work of women, of gender theory, of critical theory aimed toward things like um, heteronormativity, ableist uh, ableism theory, um, or the, I guess the dominance of ableism. Um, and then there are other things like making sure that we use artistic practice in all forms of epistemology, including science, and that's mainly inspired by the work of Michel Serre. Um, so that we can understand that all forms of knowledge are also forms of power, whether they claim objectivity or not. Um, and care, the ethics of care, caring for this world at this time. So, uh, you know, it's not an apocalyptic vision. Um, many, many people who heard about the manifesto but didn't read it, um, and this was reported in the right-wing news in Britain and across the world, that I was some kind of harbinger of mass murder, some, you know, new age Jim Jones or something, because they took antinatalism as mass genocide, which I thought said so much more about how human exceptionalists apprehend certain claims as inherently violent and genocidal. Um so, you know, obviously antinatalism proposes a slow devolution of life, human life on Earth, and that those of us here can continue to care. Um, the idea that we need to breed in order to have something to care about seems particularly peculiar to me. Um, so those are sort of active actions that are within the grasp to greater or lesser degrees of most humans on earth and they seem kind of humble and not that much of a big ask and I think what they are asking is for us to dehabituate our privilege as humans that we take as also necessarily um, compulsory as well that you know there's this sense of compulsory exploitation in human exceptionalism and there's also a sense that taking alternate routes such as antinatalism and veganism is somehow a privation which I think is simply incorrect in in fact the imagination and the curiosity that is involved in antinatalism and veganism is more resonant with the curiosity involved in incorporating artistic thought into things like science 
and it makes those actions more joyful rather than some kind of deprivation that is based on habits that um, are fostered through violence and exploitation. So I think there are also a lot of interrogations of default modes of perception in how we understand what we do and why we do them and our so-called right to do them. Um, and I also think that each individual and each collective's manifestation of those practices will necessarily look different and, again, that means that it's important to understand these suggestions toward radical compassion as not being new impositions of power structures but as being suggested uh, peaks of interest or potentials for curiosity for uh, each each variety of the collectives around the world, locally and globally. Yeah, let's delve into that. I'd love to hear your perspective on what drives our insistence on ensuring the continuation of our species and why shouldn't the cessation of human reproduction be seen as a tragic conclusion for our species? Yeah, this is this is really perplexing to me too because... I'm still waiting for a really good answer as to why humans should perpetuate. And I've heard so many different, you know, so many different ideas and none of them seem particularly convincing. And interestingly, most of the people who have given me these ideas have also ended up talking themselves out of it because when they take these ideas to their exhausted conclusion, they realise that, what we're doing is feeding our own hubris and our own sense of self-importance, even though we know it's a lie. Um, and I think that that is something that is difficult to confront, that myth of the importance of the human species is a lie that we tell ourselves in order to perpetuate our existence, which is ultimately pretty meaningless, except we can create care and practices of care that can enrich the lives of other humans and non-humans. And I, I, I also think there, there's another disjunct there, that we would rather procreate and start with this sense of a tabula rasa of a human entity to perfect, which is a kind of Frankenstein myth, right? Um, we'd rather do that than care for each other and care for the non-human animals that are right in front of us begging for care. You know, mm -hmm. why, why do we procreate when there are millions of children in desperate need of care, of love, of nurturing, of thriving? Um, and also what right do we have? That's that's quite a, I mean, that's a quite an antinatalist sort of proper, less environmentalist question, but it still is a pretty important question because you have to have a pretty secure sense of your own brilliance to feel like you can breed another human and not fuck them up. But... Who am I to say that other people's hubris isn't, you know, deeply toxic? Um, we, we keep hoping, and I think hope is an important thing, but I think that the problem with the kind of hope we have is that it follows the same tired trajectory. And... I'm more interested in the hopes that operate as escape routes from human exceptionalism. I think they're less mapped out, so they're, they're more difficult, but at the same time I think that difficulty offers an opportunity for creativity. Um, the feedback I got from the book, and by feedback I mean death threats and hate mail, was all around the antinatalism. It was really interesting that, people were accepting of the other tenets, even the veganism, but not the antinatalism. Um, and 
that I found really curious Mm -hmm. because that happened, that violent reaction, that really violent reaction seemed to me to be a very visceral encounter with the meaninglessness of life as an ontological concept abstracted from the meaningfulness of material interactions of care. So, mm-hmm. you know, we it's not, I'm not an existentialist, but I thought that we'd already figured out the meaninglessness of life and I thought we'd done that. That was quite retro. Um, but it seems to me that we actually haven't worked through that as a kind of dark, repressive moment um, because it all centres in many ways around, again, our own hubris, but our own encounter with death and our own encounter with the I, with the sense of self. Um, because, you know, the, the stereotype is, oh, well, having children makes life meaningful. But it doesn't. And it also is incredibly impactful to create life to make one's own self meaningful. And it's not particularly ethical to do that. Um, And I know that all ethics and all relations of care run risks of am I doing it in a way that is thriving? Am I doing it in a way that is, you know, put very simply right or wrong? Am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? Um, we, We all have to address those ethical relations we all have to see if we can um observe a thriving in the other that is not based on our own premises of what thriving looks like but which is of the other entirely so all relations are impossible disjunct but creating new humans um and then looking at the way that we exploit the world's resources um is to me such a strange response to the meaninglessness of the sense of self when there are so many other ways that this seems to be the only way not even the default way but it is the it's the lazy reversion and you see it in a lot it's kind of like You know, Carol Adams talks about she has that brilliant example of going to a feminist conference and you see all these women talking about alterity and otherness and um, even like now intersectional versions of feminism. But then they'll sit down and they'll just eat the flesh of another person, another organism. Um, And that disjunct seems so strange. And I see the same thing in environmentalists having children. I think... I, I don't understand where that um, arrogant blind spot happens. Um, so I think it is also something we don't really talk about yet. I think that antinatalism hasn't, It's it, and it's quite a divided field. So even within antinatalism, there are different arenas. There's ethylism where... Um, certain antinatalists think that all life is suffering and so that we should literally take out all life on earth. Um, then there are antinatalists who aren't particularly environmentalists um, and then there are antinatalists like me who are also um, quite voraciously uh, animal rights and abolitionist oriented. But it is still considered a pretty niche area Um it's considered nihilistic, which I couldn't think of anything more nihilistic than having a child to make yourself feel like there's meaning in your own life. Like, um, it's considered pessimistic, but, again, I think that it's the opposite. I think it's pure optimism to say there is life here that needs care. What can we do? So, I, I you know, I, I don't want to psychoanalyse the entire human species, but I am really still waiting for an answer to the question why are humans so important that the species need to continue and even from a utilitarian perspective 
and I'm no, no utilitarian, but, you know, on balance, let's look at what humans have done to the earth versus what humans have done good for the earth. And I think it's pretty fair to say we, we haven't been the most benevolent species. Um, and that goes not only for the human species, but also why an individual would choose to procreate. Um, and I was very interested recently to see that um, Franco Berardi, who is a big influence in my work, uh, was interviewed in uh, La Paese in Spain and mentioned for the first time antinatalism in his work. But then he said to me, and I, I do I do agree with this to an extent, but it is more difficult for men to speak about reproductive futurity mm -hmm. than women, even though the most famous book on antinatalism is by a men's rights activist called uh, David Benatar. Um, but, um, you know, so I do, I do think that in a way, once again, it's fallen to feminism and to women to be um, at the forefront of antinatalism. But having said that, most of the death threats and hate mail I got were very much about my supposed required role as a woman. So there is also an intersection between hatred towards antinatalism and misogyny and racism as well because I, I got quite a few strange um, emails from like white Christian men saying, you know, you have a responsibility to perpetuate the white race as well. So I think that as we are uncovering why people have such a visceral aversion to antinatalism, we're also uncovering the way that that aversion intersects with misogyny and racism and other horrible um, oppressive regimes and paradigms. So, you know, potentially that is a way to integrate antinatalism into normal conversations about oppression because pronatalism has a deep and intimate relationship with white nationalism, fundamentalist Christianity and trad wife misogyny. What is it in your view that causes the despair of knowing that our existence will eventually come to an end? I mean, after all, human life is inherently finite. We confront this reality from the earliest encounters with death, whether in the natural world or within our own communities with mortality so ever-present and inescapable. Why do we struggle to envision this future as potentially joyous, as something yeah. to cherish? Well, I mean, it's a really unanswerable question. You know, philosophy has these unanswerable questions and I, I keep returning to them in the manifesto. And my new book is Death Activism and it's about this navigation with death or this dance with death, like a kind of philosophical dance macabre. Um, I mean, I think that another default is death is bad and or more correctly, death is bad for certain kinds of people. Death is expected for other kinds of people and non-human people. Um, and that categorization, which really abstracts death because it, it shows that death is not one word because if, if these people die and it's, expected or normal and these people die and it's not, then we're not really talking about the same definition of death anymore. So I think that we even grapple to define the most ordinary, dominant, normal, pervasive thing that happens to literally nearly every single life form on earth. We struggle to just define that as consistent. So, you know, animals that are bred in order to be murdered, that's not life, but it's also not death in the anthropocentric mind. Certain kinds of people, whether it's people that we are related to or love, so they can never die, or people that are so self-important that they can never die. Again, that's like their life is about the signification of who they are, not the fact that they are simply a living organism. And therefore, their death is considered impossible, even though 
death and impossibility cannot coexist. Um, so we, I think that we really don't cope well with the absolute inevitable ordinariness of death and that that tempers simultaneously our understanding of what it means to be a living being like the ways in which we live seem to be haunted by the concept or the potential of death in a way that really means that death controls our living more than living staves off death really mm. and so that inextricability you know we, we talk a lot in, in in philosophy especially continental philosophy about how um you know the interdependence and interrelatedness of so-called binaries that they're not really binaries at all they're so dependent on each other that they are a plane of consistency and i think life and death are the same in that sense um and also uh because um I have a degenerative illness that will most likely kill me um, and that seems to me to be a mercy. There's also this, you know, along with the ordinariness of billions of animals being murdered every day, every day, we have the idea that one's individual self must deny death except for many people we are already living in a dying state or what um, the artist Martin O'Brien calls zombie time where you've been given like X amount of years and once you've passed those years, you're living in a state that may be a state of suffering or a state of pain. And um, so for many people, death seems merciful, seems a friend. You know, it's like death and the maiden that we turn toward death rather than turn away from death. And so you can't even say death is bad because death is not always bad. Um, and then there are people that just don't want to live for no reason. Like, you know, there, there are those diseases that are, oh, it's okay if you want death, but it's not okay if you want death. So people who suffer from certain kinds of depression or some people just don't want to be alive. Um, and so it's interesting that, you know, earlier we were talking about this idea of the sovereign subject and, who am I and I own myself and therefore I will breathe. And yet what we don't own is our own death. That's the access to death for the so-called privileged person, say the, the Western person or um, the, the person in, in our countries, for example, is really very difficult to die well, to suicide well, easily, comfortably, painlessly, is almost impossible and it is definitely illegal in this country at least to access something like dignitas for example costs around about 10 to 12000 pounds and you have to go there so all of this fantasy about free will and the one thing we don't have access to is our own death and so i am interested in you know being re-enchanted or differently enchanted with what we mean when we say death because we have this concept now of social death of the worthy death the unworthy death and that says so much about how we place humans and non-human animals um, into hierarchies you know six billionaires who die in a submarine is a tragedy um, hundreds of refugees who die on a beach is a statistic and we're proving the famous quote of Stalin's that, you know, it's, it's not so much when one person dies as a tragedy, when a million people die, it's a statistic. It's more when one certain kind of person dies. So this interrogation of the worthy death and the unworthy death or the countable death, the grievable death and the ungrievable death is such an indictment against our definition of what counts or who counts when we talk about life. And therefore, shows that for some people and for many, most non human animals, life is not given as a living existence. It's given as a precarious, um, you know, a precarious state that is at risk. Um, 
And so I think that along with those questions about, you know, what is the meaning of life, we have how can I how can I avoid death? Because I think the ultimate anthropocentric question is how do I avoid death? And I've heard so many different versions of that. You know, people who are male zones, so people who eat meat, they say, you know, I'm eating death. So therefore I feel like it's a, it's a form of cannibalism. And then um, people say I'm avoiding death by having children or I'm avoiding death by believing in whatever religion, or whatever afterlife. So much of life is death avoidance and fine. If there are delusions that help you get through the day, go for it. Um, but it is unavoidable. So it's strange that our avoidance techniques temper our lives in a way that deny the life that we have to live because we're so fixated on the death that we think we're going to avoid. Mm. And, of course, we see that. We see that most explicitly in transhumanism and the fact that AI and certain works on transhumanism will be the ultimate example of those who get uploaded and live forever and the millions who work for the technology but will never have access. That thing you said about death on demand being also somewhat of a luxury product was so powerful. Um, do you think that human egoism and exceptionalism is some sort of spiritual gutter from which we must ascend to progress or are these two merely ingrained aspects of human nature? Well, I, I mean, I don't really know much about nature versus nurture when it comes to human exceptionalism, but I love I love that statement. It is the gutter from which we must ascend because it is a gutter because it is the default thing into which people fall. You know, people, it's it's the easiest route. It's the most... Um, uh, it's the most trodden route, but also it's the route that I think shows our the susceptibility we have to be enamoured with whatever power we can access. You know, we because we have this, um, and this is why Franco Baradi's work is so powerful to me because he talks about this idea of semi-capitalism and how um, we've gone from being comrades to competitors. And how, um, you know, even in collectives, whether it's a spiritual collective or a political collective, there seems to be this Orwellian enamorment of power and a little bit of power one gets a taste for it. And I think that that is where the work of Spinoza becomes so important for me because the differentiation between his potestas, which is power, and potentia, which is more like, you know, force or curiosity, that power is not only easy but it feels luxurious and so in a way it works perfectly in semio-capitalism that any form of power is a, a luxury item that we want to add to our daily experience and it doesn't have much of a relationship with happiness or with joy or with curiosity it's incredibly empty which is why it is such an unsatisfying Lacanian form of object desire because once you have power you want a little bit more then you want a little bit more um, and it is sort of this ultimate addictive empty referent but we think it'll make life easier and let's face it it's easier to live a rich a rich person's life than a um, struggling person's life. But this power is about the fantasy that is perpetuated in capitalism, that, you know, just strive for a little more power and then strive for a little bit more. <clears throat> and it, it feeds that idea that human exceptionalism thrives on, that instead of us being part of the world, the world is for us. The world exists for us. The world exists for you. The world is your oyster. You know, take what you need. Follow your, like, it, it can be quite hippie, follow your dreams, or it can be quite brutal, take, you know, take what you want. But the point is that it shows an inward-facing consumption of the world 
that is deeply capitalist rather than an outward facing expression of um, potentia in which we can forge relations with the world and its many aspects, which I think is more akin to care, to joy, possibly to happiness, um, rather than the idea that it's about uh, fulfilment and satisfaction and taking what you need or taking what you want, which are all human exceptionalist, unfulfillable fantasies. Mm -hmm. So I guess that structure of desire, that shift from Lacan to say Deleuze and Guattari is an important one because one is an inward facing taking of fantasies of the world and the other is a forging of connectivities based on Spinozan ethics with the world without demanding to know that with which you make connections. Mm. So difference and alterity are also incredibly important parts of that. There's another bit I'd like to read from your introduction um, to the A-Human Manifesto. This manifesto may seem to hate humans. It does not. It simply seeks different trajectories to the more typical political, academic, human versus human arguments. It is a manifesto of doing something right now, individually, collectively, artistically. It is a manifesto of joy, but the joy is for our, all life, not only ours. Joy is a concept that ideally requires no extensive explanation, yet what we perceive as joyous often varies significantly. I also believe that our notions of joy are heavily influenced by consumerism. In a society constantly yearning for more, joy becomes perhaps the most short-lived emotion experienced fleetingly before shifting our focus to the, to the next desire. Moreover, joy as a fundamental moral principle, as you have written, should not be enjoyed at the expense of others, which regrettably is often the case. What I would like to invite you to share, if you're willing, and you have already in some parts done that, is your diagnosis of humanity. While you extensively address what actions we should take now and in the future, uh, how do you perceive the anthropological origins of our current state? Well, I'm not an anthropologist. I don't really know. I don't, I really don't know. And what I'm more curious about is what the purpose or function of trying to trace these are. I think it's a valid question to ask where do these come from? But we are so alienated from need or from the originary understanding of need. So there are lots of people that need, like, you know, people are choosing between food and fuel, people are choosing to survive. But this idea of a homogenized humanity that needs certain things and therefore evolutionary biology says this is why we behave this way, it sounds so much or so frequently like an excuse rather than um, an explanation. And I... I'm also with Judith Butler in the sense that I think that we are so abstracted from evolutionary biology in terms of even our ability to access an understanding of it that is not filtered through anthropocentric ideology that we don't know how to access an understanding of why we, we behave the way we behave. And I think that it comes down in the in the first instance to this notion of what do we mean by human? What do we mean, um, you know, what do we mean, who, who counts as human? What is the purpose of division of species? What is the function of division of species? When we signify and subjectify people based on gender or race or ability or um, sexuality or um, socioeconomic level, what is the purpose and function of that practice? Um, and then when we create species hierarchies, 
are, are we able to access knowledge without creating hierarchies based on that knowledge? When we say human, are we really honestly, authentically able to say every single human? Are we ever consciously or unconsciously able to prioritise otherness and alterity without demanding knowledge of that otherness and alterity so that the other proves its worth and value and therefore is allowed to exist. So I often quote that um, statement from Agamben, it's not what someone or something is, it's that they are. But anthropocentrism really wants to know the what they are and is less willing to allow that they are. Um, so I think that at this point we use knowledge and, you know, Michelle Sayre talks a lot about knowledge as a form of violence, as an act of war, that to know the other is a demand for the other to prove their right to exist. Um, to know the other is to wage war because it will always be a comparative understanding of what someone else is and then where is the value based on what I am and it will be dissymmetrical. And he um, he says that this physics makes, and we see it today especially. I mean, I'm sure every age has said yes especially, but this uh, the, the, the fact that everyone now has an opinion on everything but it always seems to be in opposition to something else, this act of war that we encounter, that our discursive communion seems to have been diminished and now we are sort of living in an age of epistemological war and knowing the other, demanding the other speak, um, demanding why the other deserves rights. So... This is the absolute opposite of what Sia calls, you know, a Venusian um, terrain or an act of love, which is the other is and that is sufficient. There is no more needed for the other to be allowed to thrive. And that, of course, relates back to Spinoza, the idea of common notions, which is that entities have a common notion when they are in relation with each other, but neither are aware of what they have in common. Mm -hmm. And really all it comes down to is that all they have in common is the need for liberty and the need to thrive. Um, and that is how Spinoza defines joy. He says that the ability and capacity to thrive, that is the definition of joy. And a bad ethics occurs when one diminishes the other's capacity to thrive and that is what causes pain. So joy might not always feel good um, and in my new book I've talked about animal rights as being a form of, uh, a form of lament um, in reference to like the Korah of uh, ancient Greek tragedy because it's an activism that seeks joy but it's not always pleasant and it's definitely not always pleasurable. Um, but it is still, it is imminent. So as you say, this idea of joy being fleeting, we seem to be looking for perpetual states and that's why we, 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 we've created this hierarchy, we've created something we have to climb, whether it's in our lives or our careers, you know, we're still climbing. And we think that that is thriving. But of course, that's not. That's creating a linear time with punctuations. It's making life a kind of capitalist grammar. But joy is ephemeral, undefinable, and it is the encounter with otherness, I think, without the demand for knowing the other. And so it's imminent. It's pure, you know, Bergsonian imminence. And that is enough. But we we think in terms of nomenclature, like how can I capture it, how can I own it, how can I make it perpetual? And it's the same thing we do with our own existence. How can I refine it, capture it, make it 
perpetual, which is why we have all these 70 plus people in power wanting to blow up the world because they don't know how to understand their own aging and they're just grasping onto the last moments of power they can have. So whether it's Putin or Trump or whoever, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tendency to, it's a tendency to have an inability to experience joy. And I think that capitalism does breed a certain form of anhedonia because it's empty signifiers of fulfillment. So when they are achieved, they are not fulfilling. Um, so, you know, the ephemeral nature of joy is something that defies the fantasy of fulfillment. During a panel discussion at the Institute of Art and Ideas, you characterize goodness as an act of grace, a sexy, alluring, enigmatic pursuit that demands a commitment to what's not straightforward or easy. How can we promote the notion that goodness is inherently attractive, particularly in a world seemingly enamored with depictions of evil and destruction? I think that it shows that we love to attach values to significations anyway. It seems kind of arbitrary that good is unsexy and evil is sexy. I mean, for a lot of people, I'm evil. So maybe maybe it very much depends on your perspective. But because we still cling to this idea that there is a single universal human perspective, we also cling to the idea that, you know, Evil is sexy, but evil is defined as consumption and good is defined as maybe a bit pious or a bit preachy or something like that. And that's why I like Spinoza's ethics because all he defines good as is allowing the other to thrive and evil is causing the other pain by diminishing their capacity for expression. So they don't have a value, they don't have an attached adjective to them so it's a really basic principle um i i think we have also been trained in capitalism to temper our lack so everyone feels like they want something more but instead of creating more through communion with alterity which is interesting and curious and definitely sexy we've made uh oppression sexy we've made getting over on other people the way to uh, to rise you know you rise on the bodies of others that has been constructed as the way to um, achieve a sexy kind of heightening of one's own status. That is the opposite of sexy because you're left standing on a pile of corpses, so there's no capacity for any form of libidinality. You know, it's a dead, it's a it's a death bound form of achievement. Um, whereas goodness, first of all, you can't know goodness in advance. You can only sort of put your faith in it, which sounds a bit pseudo religious, but I do write about that in the manifesto that, you know, faith and hope are two things that um, can help in ethics because we can never know in advance whether our actions, even if we have the best intentions, will be benevolent. That uncertainty, I think, should be sexy because repetition is not sexy. Um, that's why people fall out of love, right, because you know what's going to happen. But um, also maybe we should not think of goodness as necessarily good because not only can we not know it in advance, but we also don't know the other or others in which, in, within which we're in a constellation. So, it, I mean, I think maybe what we can hope for is interesting rather than good. Will it be interesting? And interesting has associations with both curiosity and artistry. 
you know, w will it peak my capacity for artistry? That's a getting something out of it if you want, getting, you know, that's the capitalist hubris payoff. I mean, I know that a lot of my students want to be more activist, but they're so used to the capitalist version of that where you've got something to show for it at the end that they don't understand the quiet, uncertain nature of activism um, and therefore maybe, you know, we have to grapple with this idea of is goodness that is done with a payoff in mind actually good, which is a very like Francis, uh, Franciscan St. Francis kind of idea, like is good done in the name of God good? Or is accidental good based on curiosity good? And I, I, I'm not saying that one or the other is better. What I am saying is that operating via those playbook narratives of payoff have a tendency to repetition that is less likely to change things, whereas relations fostered on curiosity and hope for good but basically forging a relationship in a difficult situation or under difficult circumstances because it's necessary or it's needed, which is what activism is, then, you know, that's that's interesting at least and tricky and better for your synaptic differentiation. Mm -hmm. um, so who can say what is good or evil because it's such a perspectival Thing. I mean, remember, most of the horrific things done are done with the absolute conviction of the people who perpetrate them in the name of good. Maybe we need to get rid of the words altogether, good and evil. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, aren't we already beyond, did, did nature already take us beyond good and evil? Mm -hmm. I mean, he, that, that's a really good example because he takes us into the world of Spinoza and Potentia in that book. And that is really the best we can hope for. What what are you, what are you doing that is curiosity based to change relations of power? That should be the measure, rather than are you doing good? Are you doing evil? Right, with, without any particular motive, right? Yeah. Because motive is really good. important. Yeah. yeah. You also um, discuss the problematic of a common perception of revolution as it usually seeks to liberate the we as specific collective groups, whereas the contemporary world is dividing humans into two, an overwhelming and growing Anthropocene and what you term the a-human. Um, this prioritization of individual identity and personal autonomy, as you claim, has various motivations. Most frequently, it is the belief that one must first liberate one's oneself before being able to liberate others, how would you envision a, an a human revolution? Would you even choose to call it a revolution? Well, I mean, I, I subscribe to Guattari's idea of molecular revolutions, that, there, you know, there is no one revolution because one revolution would mean one replacement, and we know that that doesn't work. I think that these molecular or micro revolutions are occurring every single day, but they don't make the news because they're not saleable or mm -hmm. particularly interesting to those in amateur power. So we are already, everyone, I'm sure, everyone in their own way performs micro revolutions frequently. Whether or not they want to get congratulated for it is another question. But I think that the only consistent intensity that would be shared by all of these acts of revolution would be a diminishment of our love of power and a diminishment of our compulsion to make things hierarchical and perceive that as valuable. Um, I think that a prioritization of connectivity without knowledge of the other is something that is shared by all molecular revolution. And so it's not prescriptive um, and it makes artists of us all, whether we're scientists or philosophers or activists or all of the above. I'm also interested in hearing your thoughts on the feminine, the queer, the demonic, the multiple, the fluid, 
in other words, occultism and the secular spirituality. While this is a vast topic, there seems to be a resurgence of interest in these expressions. For once, I see a huge revival of paganism in my native Poland. Um, would you be willing to discuss how return to expressions through such spiritual practices can be an act of, of, of activism in itself, or perhaps some form of liberation from the static that clearly defines the normal? Well, I think that I think there's a really important point to be made here, which is that there are two revivals going on with occultism and esoterica. One is a return, as you say, and mm. this is a really problematic one. This is the kind of neo folk going back to nationalist fantasies and myths of humanism. So they're all right wing nonsense by desperate people who want to have some sense of. Um, superiority. So that's not the occultism that I'm interested in. The occultism I'm interested in is definitely not a return. It's a reinvigoration of certain pagan ideas, but that have been highly evolved and adapted to create very queer trajectories. So a lot of these activisms, um, there's like Uh, trans neo-paganism or neo-occultism is queer um, occultism, feminist occultism, but none of them are looking back to an originary myth or anything like that. I think that what they share is a, a, a sense of reclaiming the chaos of nature, a sense of using that chaos to become more self-reflective and actually destroy the sense of self in a positive, chaotic way rather than spend our lives reifying this highly polished sense of self that we are trying to cultivate in neo-capitalism. And I also think that it's a refusal of organised religion or even, in many circumstances, organised esoteric practices that have orders, that have degrees and hierarchies. So... It's definitely a refusal of hierarchy. It's a celebration, which we also see in activism, of the one and the many. So you can be part of a coven or a collective, but it's non-hierarchical, but you can also practice on your own. There's no there's no more rules. There's no more. So you can be highly trained and cultivated without being obedient. Um, it's a general celebration of subjective disobedience you know, disobedient women, disobedient um, non-heteronormatives. You know, we do need to hold on to something. We're, we're not we're not so liberated yet that we can hold on to something. And, you know, I hold on to philosophy and I hold on to culture. But it's a way to hold on to something and to be guided without dogma or without that potestas, that overarching system of power from which one cannot deviate. So it's a way to inspire and foster curiosity and it's a way to refuse the idea of truth being arbitrarily imposed by those in power so there is still truth but there is no truth in certain values which are what constitutes the creation of a hierarchy where it's said that it is true that this person is superior to this person or something like that and it's also a really good occulture is also a really good practice when we run out of ideas for activism. You know, doing doing rituals uh, is basically like an artistic experiment in thinking what, what to do next. So I think that that highly individual, whether it's individual as a person or collective, adaptation of historic esoteric practice shows that the revival is not a return. It is something with huge novelty. And it shows that people don't want dogma anymore, that they want creative practice to be their spiritual guide rather than legislation. In your writing, you also emphasize that radical compassion is both simple and challenging. Simple because the practice of compassion is somewhat natural to all and accessible to most demographics. Yet challenging because acknowledging our human privilege can lead to a sobering awareness of the damage caused. 
You argue that ending the privileging of humanity may lead some to contemplate suicide and others to embrace antinatalism. And regardless of the choice, we should not succumb to a glorified martyrdom. What steps do you think are necessary for us to cultivate radical compassion? How can we effectively impart teaching on compassion? I think the easiest way, the easiest way that is available to everyone right now is to let go of the ego. And in particular, the way that capitalism has turned the ego into a cultivated, refined, sovereign subject. I think it's letting go of that would make us less miserable because that practice is also one that is destined to fail and it also enables connectivity that's that's as easy as it gets and it you know my new book every chapter is about a different aspect of death but all of them seem to be about the death of the ego first that's mm. the, it's it's the most prevalent form of caring more about everyone, including yourself. Ironically, it's easy to care for yourself when you don't have a self that you're aspiring to care for. So it's it's not death-bound in a detrimental way. It's death-bound in a liberating way. Is there a lasting message that you would you would hope the listeners to take away from our conversation? Um, I just think that we need to examine our motives a little bit more closely and ask ourselves if there's something I can do, why am I not doing it, and stop making excuses. I think that we have so much energy. We have, you know, the ties, a cursed share of energy, and we pour so much of that energy into empty signifiers that don't bring any joy to anyone. And it would be wonderful for us to annihilate our egos and start indulging in the joyfulness of radical compassion. Yeah, this seems like a fitting moment to shift uh, the focus from ears and mouths to the heart for anyone who still needs to hear this. This is where the true change happens despite our glorification of the brain. I like to end these episodes with a, with a bit of a cliche. Um, I call on you all to allow yourself to be soft, at least sometimes. In a world weighted down by hardships and violence, we require nonviolence to be the driving force of change to prevent perpetuating the same destructive cycles. Um, as always, I encourage you all to delve into Patricia's work you'll find a link to the A Human Manifesto below this episode. Keep hopeful and keep exploring.